Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. They love you. I think it's you. <laughs> Welcome to our fair shores. I understand you arrived this morning. I did. A little, a little jet lagged. It's 11 o'clock my time, but I'm kind of good at late hours, so. You are. Let's get to that right away. You, uh, after this tonight, and it will be something like 2 a.m. Eastern time, you're still going to put out your daily newsletter, right? Why, did something happen to that? No. No, but the, the great thing is that even on an incredibly slow news day like today. So the truth is I have a picture for tonight and, and like nobody told Congress. So, so yes, in fact, I will go home and Or oh, you were going to just post a picture? I was going to post a picture. I wrote over the weekend because I knew it was going to be a really late night tonight, so I saved up my day off for tonight. But nobody apparently told Kevin McCarthy. Yeah. Well, he, he had less to do with it than you might think, but we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that in a moment. Let's, let's start by trekking back to 2019. Um, we are in the greasy, burger-filled belly of the Trump administration. And it's just a grim time. Um, for me, and of course I do want to make this partly about me, I, I was about a year out of having, having left um, the job at, at Bill Maher's shop, and I left for a variety of reasons, but one of the main ones was that uh, political humor stopped making sense as a humorous thing to me anymore. I would wake up in dread every morning at 5 a.m. to see what was being tweeted out of the East Coast, and it was horrifying. Um, Nobody wanted to talk about it, uh, but everybody could talk about nothing else. And there in 2019, I assume, and you can tell me if I'm right, just to help you maintain your sanity, you started writing uh, about what happened that day on Facebook and placing it in a historical context. Is that correct? Well, yes, but it was not nearly that directed in the sense that I had been writing an essay on Facebook about once a week for a while, not necessarily about politics or about history, but just things that interested me. Sometimes they were personal, sometimes they were about history. It's kind of an exercise in writing and in, you know, just providing content that I thought was pretty decent out there. And I was moving, I was doing a number of things, and I was painting outside, and I got stung by a yellow jacket, and I'm allergic. And I did not have Oof. an EpiPen, and I live a long way from a hospital. So I thought I should, before I did anything, get in a car, for example, I should, should see how I was going to react. And I right. sat down, and I thought, well, I haven't written an essay for a while on Facebook. I'll just write and say what I think the world looks like today. And that was September 15th, 2019. Oof. And I got a flood of questions, because I had written about the fact that um, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, had written a demanding, demanding or a demand letter to the acting director of national intelligence who, and saying, we know there's been a whistleblower who has said something about someone, and by law, you were supposed to give it to us, and you haven't, so hand that sucker over. And I recognized that that was the first time that a member of the legislative branch had accused a member of the executive branch of breaking a specific law. So there had been a lot out there about you know, emoluments, sure. and, you know, but that was the first specific, you and guys broke a law. Was this the beginning of the um, first impeachment? Well, it was the, yes, this but who the, knew, what, right? What turned out to be right. Vindeman, maybe, or? No, Vindeman was not the whistleblower. There okay. was a different whistleblower. Vindeman was on the call, as was his brother, as I recall. Um, but 
I wrote about that, and then um, and then just I was flooded with people asking questions, and I right. thought, well, nobody wants to write every day because that's just kind of obnoxious. <laughs> and so I didn't write the next. I was just looking at this the other day. I wouldn't have remembered this otherwise. I didn't write the next day, right? And then. So that was the 16th of September, I didn't write. And on the 17th, I said, well, I better answer all these people. And within three weeks, I knew that something big was happening. And you and were I've, writing every day from that point? I've written every night since, yeah. Every night 17, since, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. And it is except, amazing. Except, now, I, go ahead. Except I haven't written tonight yet, so you, we'll but you will. <laughs> we're not gonna keep you up all night, See, although many of these people- you trust that I'm gonna. You know, one of these nights, maybe I'll be like, hey, they think I'm gonna write. Oh yeah, but then, you, I'm then, kidding. then I you're do that. all of a sudden you're Cal Ripken. Your streak is broken, yeah. but it, you know it's a record. Everybody's That's a happy. thing. That's a thing, man. There are nights when I've been sick in this past four years, and I'm crawling out of bed, going like, I have to write. And Buddy's <laughs> like, No, you don't. I'm like, Yes, I do. It's a streak now. Oh my. well, yeah, it is a streak, and it's an important streak. And I guess it was 2020. You uh, you made a little transition over to newsletters and Substack, and at this point, you are you know, known across the whole country, indeed the world, and uh, one descriptor of you I read uh, recently was the most successful independent journalist in America? Except I'm not a journalist, but yes. Right, okay. That's what I'm told. So the most successful person in America. There you go. Uh, <laughs> hey, listen, unlike some people tonight, I've got a job. I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have said that. It's very late by time. <laughs> yeah. That's hitting home very, very close to you, in fact. Um, <laughs> I turned into script yesterday, so if you know Ooh, anybody who needs yeah. anything. Um, okay, I was so, actually referring to somebody in Washington. Right, who I bet is. and again, we'll get to okay. our friend Kevin in just a moment. Um, okay, so you, you're, um, you're, you're doing the Substack thing, and now you're, you're on a nationwide book tour for your new book, which we're about to get to. How weird is that? and your current celebrity status for an academic, because you're a history professor. Yeah, so history professor's happy place is in the bottom of the library with, with papers that nobody has looked at in 150 years. <laughs> and so the one thing that I would be very cautious about saying is that I didn't do any of this. I have been extremely well trained. That, that is true. My advisors trained me incredibly well, and I love research. I'm very good at research. I'm, I'm probably, I would, I would venture to say I'm one of the best people in the world at research. And I'm a decent writer. Not the, a genius writer, I'm a You're decent a very writer. Good writer. Well, I've written more than a, a million words now. But, but what is happening with, with people knowing who I am and all that, that's you. That is absolutely you. It is not me. I was in the right place at the right time, answering the right questions for the right people. And so it's a weird thing in the sense that my life hasn't changed in the sense that I sit at the same laptop in the same chair, writing the same stuff to the same people. It's just there are a lot more of them than there used to be. It's fantastic. And, and the, so I'm incredibly lucky. I have a job I love Right. in addition to this job. I meet totally cool people. I get right. to spend you're, you're all my time at, at Boston research. College, mm -hmm. and um, I, I don't mind saying when I was 22 years old, I taught a, a, a workshop in long-form improvisation oh, to uh, Boston College's uh, troupe, My Mother's Fleabag. So we have almost the exact same career. That's great. That's great. That's great. <laughs> it's a great school, though. I love the campus, so I can see why you, you know, you kind of got it made right now except for the entire death of democracy thing. Yeah, well, that's kind of a problem. I would like a little more sleep than I get. Yeah, that does seem... I would also like to spend time with my really lovely husband. Oh. I, whom I married last year, so... Oh, congratulations. Yeah, well, that's I mean, it's a little late to be like, but, but you know, he's, he's, he's kind of nice. I'd like to spend more time with him. And he's in Maine where you live. He's a lobsterman, yeah. A lobsterman. Yeah. So not just in Maine, but an archetypal Mainer. Oh my God, Mainer. so archetypal. Wow. <laughs> and, and yeah, well, I Does he have a slicker and waiters and all that stuff hanging in the mud room? And, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, 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 and, uh, and, uh, and the accent. And it's so funny because this is, I don't even know if this is being recorded, but I don't hear the accent when we're in the same room. I just don't hear it. Like, he, he sounds to me like you sound to me, right? Okay. But we can't talk on the phone. 
because I'm like, who the hell is on the other end of this phone? Uh, yeah. like, <laughs> totally. I'm like, I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, like, who is this guy? And, and it's him, but I don't hear it. We're in the same room, like, but we don't talk on the phone. Um, wow. Uh, I, I was about to attempt a main accent. I'm not going to do it because you live with the genuine article. It's not the, it's not the loss of the R's or any of that. It's the timing. And that's something that almost no actor gets right because it's not at all about the sound. Anybody can do the sounds, right? But you cannot do the timing because the timing is, is, I, I mean, like nobody could be Betty White either because she had timing as well. Oh, that's right. Yeah. that's good. So everybody in Maine is just like Betty White. Um, a hundred percent. Let's talk about the book because that is what you're touring about. Although you're talking about the book so much these days, are you bored of it yet? It's not that. I mean, in a way, when you write a book, you're, you're, when it's over, it's, it's kind of over, right? I'm working on the next one at this point. Okay. But it's, it's more And that's a murder mystery. Totally. <laughs> Actually, it's not a murder mystery. But oh. I don't know. I know some of you probably listened to Joanne's and my podcast. Isn't the idea of a trashy novel with Theodosia Burr turning into a pirate the best idea you've ever heard? <laughs> I'm like, and, and my producer is like, I'm on board. And Joanne's like, nah, we can't do that. I'm like, really? She's lost off the coast of North Carolina That's... when there are pirates going up and down, and it's right before this, you know, it's right in the, in the early 19th century, and, and she could be part of the entire coming of the Civil War. If, wow. if a novel comes out about Theodosia Burr becoming a pirate, even if it's got a pen name, <laughs> It's you. I can tell you who wrote that. <laughs> you should totally do that. And Isn't then it a great be, story? I don't want to pigeonhole Theodosia Burr. I know she had a lot of stuff going on, but uh, Not then really, it becomes a musical, it right? Her. Well, that's right. Exactly. You know? Yeah. We're good to go. We anyway, really are. so so in a way we move on, but the concepts of this are again exactly what people were asking me, and it's a way to explain where we uh, where how we got here, where right. we are, and how we get out. So in terms of that, it's all new. It's all old and it's all new and right. we're all just doing well, it again. What struck me is that what you're doing in this book is very, is, is like what you do in your newsletter but writ large in that you're placing not the events of today but the events of the last few years in a much broader historical context and you Break it down into three sections, and so let's us break it down into three sections, because I really, as I told you backstage, I love the way you structured the book. And you said something that surprised me. You said it didn't occur to you to structure it any other way. Yeah, which is odd. So the book is set up to, again, to do how we got here, where here is, and how we get out. And um, so it begins in 1937, and it goes to 2015-ish, then mm -hmm. 2015 to the present-ish, I'm sorry, I haven't read it in a while. And then, um, and then from the concept of European settlement on the North American continent to yesterday. So it's a, I guess it's a weird setup. It's, it's, it's unique in that, it, to me, it's not just that you're, it's where we were, how, you, uh, how, we, how we got to where we were, where we were and where we're going, or where we are and where we're going. You also, you jump around in history to express what you want to about Section one is a lot about the rise of what we now call conservatism, which, which you illustrate really well, kind of pushed us towards what happened in 2016 and what happened thereafter, which is this conservatism morphing into something that looks a lot more like authoritarianism. And a lot of us would like to think, well, Trump just happened and came out of nowhere, and you swat that down very ably. Do you want to talk a little bit about the various benchmark points in the conservative movement that sort of started paving the way for an authoritarian and an exclusionist impulse. Right, so the book starts in 1937 with a very little known document that was actually very important at the time and that was called the Conservative Manifesto and it was written by a number of uh, Southern Democrats who didn't like FDR's attempts to level the racial playing field in the United States uh, joining forces with the anti-business uh, regulation Republicans and deciding that they wanted to take on FDR's New Deal by advancing this idea of conservatism. 
But by that, they didn't mean Burkean conservatism, the ideas of that, you should, that a government should protect stability and try and make sure that families are safe and all things like that, 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 that Edmund Burke talked about during the French Revolution. Instead, they meant they just wanted to go back before FDR. They wanted to go back to the 1920s. So when I write about, you know, we want to go back to the 1920s, that's what I'm talking about. And the principles in that conservative manifesto were so much like what to the, the Republicans of 2016, 2017 talked about, they could have been superimposed it on is it. Shocking. It when is shocking. When you quote that shocking. manifesto, it's, it's um, I mean, they even use some of the buzz phrases. I think they use traditional values. Yes, they do. And traditional values, as, as you so ably point out, it's, it's never really what what had happened in history so much as what was the idealized version of when you guys were more powerful, right? Things were better. And I think, I think there's still that impulse to look back to the, the better times within the conservative movement, even if those times were not better. Well, so let's come back to that because that is okay. part of the overarching theory. I wrote this book as a series of essays to explain the things that people always ask me, like when do the parties switch sides? We're not a democracy, we're a republic which, as you know, makes me catch on fire. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, what does it mean? What is liberalism? Those sorts of questions. What is conservatism? Those sorts of questions. Sure. And what I found is when I wrote those down and left the manuscript alone for about three months and came back to it, it told a much more complicated story than that. So let's get to that complicated story. But the, the, that first section is how those people who conceived of getting rid of the New Deal gradually managed first to get a foothold by tapping into American racism after the passage of the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision. It's not a passage after the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 right. saying that the federal government had to protect um, equality in the public schools and stop segregation in the public schools. How they tapped into racism and then really pushed this idea that good Americans wanted to get rid of this government that, that regulated business, protected a basic social safety net, promoted infrastructure, and protected civil rights. And once they had done that and gotten Reagan elected in 18, 19, I'm sorry, 1980, um, they then recognized by 1986 that that was not popular. The things, the cuts that they were making to that liberal consensus, as it was known, were actually really unpopular. So by 1986, they start manipulating the, the mechanics of our democracy. They start suppressing the vote in, sure. in 86. They start dramatically turning toward, toward evangelical Christians to provide their voting base. That's a hugely underrated part of it, because I, I guess it would surprise people to know that uh, evangelical Christians, the Christians in politics wasn't really a thing and to the extent that it is now an organized thing until the 1980s. Isn't it astonishing? It is astonishing. But it makes sense, right? Because the whole idea was that you know, you'd give the, the worldly things to God and the, the rest of it to politics, but there was a real movement among evangelicals before the 1980s not to be involved in politics because they believed it would corrupt their religion. Huh. No, I what mean a really. Silly but, but isn't it interesting? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was the thing. That you, you didn't get in. You didn't get involved because it would hurt your religion. And of course, uh, along the way to getting to the in evangelicalism politics, we we skipped over something that you do not skip over in the book, which is um, the straight line you draw from the conservative manifesto through uh, Brown versus Board of Education and Civil Rights Act to Richard Nixon's Southern strategy, which is really, I think to me, and you can tell me if I'm wrong because you'll be right, um, <laughs> where, where the parties really flipped places forever, where those Southern Democrats were no longer Democrats. Well, I'm not gonna go for forever yet because we're not there yet. Thank you, okay. But that being said, yes, it, it's a Southern strategy, but one of the things that completely jumped out to me in this book is when, um, Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater accepts the Republican nomination in 1964 and is put over the top by the South Carolina de delegates for that nomination. I was not aware until I wrote this book that that was like, and I am exaggerating, but that was like a minute and a half after the three civil rights workers were disappeared in Mississippi and they had not been found yet. And that was an eye opener for me. And, and I, I'm exaggerating when I say in a minute and a half. I think it was about two and a half months. And I could be wrong. I'm, I, but that's I'm a historical tired. minute and a half. Yeah, exactly. 
But, but to give that speech saying that, you know, extremism in the service of liberty is no, no vice when, when there are three men missing, and of course they're gonna be turned up dead in, a, in an earthen dam within, I believe it's three miles from where Richard Nixon, I'm sorry, where Ronald Reagan gives a speech at the Neshoba County Fair and says, I believe in states' rights. That's not small, that's not a small thing. So that's 64, and in 64, for um, Goldwater, the Republicans, the, the most, the, the Republicans begin because of Goldwater, who says he will not enforce desegregation, begin to court those racist Southern Democrats. Right. And it's in 64 that Strom Thurmond of South Carolina switches sides. So that's 64, and I keep emphasizing that 64 is a really cool year. 65 is the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. So 68 is the year the party's gotta decide what they're gonna do about the fact that black Americans and soon brown Americans, I mean, they're involved too, but they're really not part of the language quite so much as, as black people are sure. in 65, are gonna be voting members of society. And the Democrats end up, Democrats who, by the way, owned the racists until yeah. 64, they go, we're gonna absorb a multicultural voting base into our movement. The Republicans who had previously been inclined to support black voting and black rights go the other way. Right. So it's the Southern strategy and we identify it with 68 because Nixon says to Strom Thurmond, quite literally to him, but also to other Southern Democrats, stick with us, we'll stop trying to enforce desegregation. But the linchpin I have come to believe was 65, the Voting Rights Act of 65. Interesting, because, and then 68 was just the everybody's chance to decide where how to vote on what had just happened. Yeah, where they were gonna stand. And it's no accident that John Roberts, who is now the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, got his start standing against the Voting Rights Act. Wow. Yeah. You know, it, the past is never past. Which, is, which you bring out every single night, including tonight, I don't envy your task. Um, <laughs> after this, um, uh, this is just cake and ice cream right here. So, <laughs> so, Let's push on, though I hate to go here, because just reading the second cake section. cake and ice cream, we're about to go into the second session. The second, I know, I know, this is, <laughs> which is like, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's very, very uh, foul cake and awful melted ice cream. When I reread the manuscript, I got halfway through the second section. I called my agent and I said, we got a real problem because nobody's ever gonna make it to the third section. This is so depressing. Like, why didn't you let me write this? Well, thank God there is a third section because, okay, so the second section, what I wanna say about it is obviously it's about Trump and you, and you, and you, you drill deep into the, some of the most um, amazingly outrageous things of the Trump administration, the watershed moments like Charlottesville um, and uh, the first impeachment and um, January 6th, of course. Um, but what I wanna get to is the fact that you, you, you illustrate in the second section by building it in the first section that it didn't come out of nowhere. He wasn't just an autocrat on the rise. He was very much playing into the same politics that fueled the conservative manifesto. Do you wanna speak about that a little bit? What did he do differently? Did he just take it to an extreme? Was he the buffoon for his time? What? So, so there's a big sort of a cottage industry of fighting about whether or not uh, Trump was simply a product of the past right. or whether he was unique, whether he did something entirely different. And I was joking the other day and saying, well, I'm a Libra, so I think it's both, right? <laughs> um, he is the product of the previous 40 years in that what the, the rise of oligarchy under the Republicans after Ronald Reagan did was it managed to put in place a series of pieces of legislation that hollowed out the middle class. And by doing that, it created a population that was eager to figure out why they had fallen behind. Why, you know, who had done this to them? And one of the reasons I found Trump absolutely fascinating from the beginning is because he was not a politician. Trump is a salesman. And if you listened to him, and I don't think that's true any longer, I think one of the things that people are gonna be very surprised about when he reappears on the national stage is the recognition that you really haven't heard from him in a long time. Even as president, he was largely kept under wraps. He has slipped significantly in the past eight years. Yeah. He has slipped significantly. And I think people are imagining the 2016 guy. Yeah. Who, 
I know everyone said, oh, he's an idiot. No, he's ter-. If you listen to his speeches, he was not an idiot. He played the audience beautifully. But if you remember when he did that in 2016, he was the most moderate person on the Republican stage in 2016. Cheaper and better health care, bring back manufacturing, make the tax, uh, the tax structures fair, close the loopholes, um, promote infrastructure, all those pieces of things that actually Joe Biden is doing. Yes. Right. But we are but, still awaiting Trump's health care plan. Yes, but it's, exactly. It's fantastic. Exactly. Well, a lot of things we're still awaiting. And then, of course, there was the other stuff as well. And many of us recognize that that was what was really going on. But, but if you wanted to believe that those pieces were going to be fixed in 2016, Trump was not a bad option if you were willing to overlook everything. Else. There was a lot to overlook. Yes. I agree with that. But I'm trying to make the case here that he, in a way, simply mirrored what the Republicans had created for the past 40 years, because that's what he does. He mirrors people. But then he gets into office. And in office, and again, most of us probably have forgotten this, but he tried, at first in, in January of 2000, uh, 2017, the Steve, Steve Bannon and Steve Miller, instantly threw us the travel ban. Yes. And threw everything into chaos. And that was a huge shock in a lot of ways. Um, not least because it was a real attempt, I think, to destabilize society yeah. and make it more likely that a, an authoritarian could rise. But then he backed off a bit until the Unite the Right rally at Charlottesville. And at that point, that was a crucially important moment because he threw his lot in with the, the, the violent gangs, the, yes. the alt-right gangs. When that happened, something important happened, I think, for what he was doing, and that is that he started to take those gangs and, and weld them into a movement. And that's different. Playing to somebody with rhetoric is one thing. Taking a bunch of people and saying, follow me because I'm the person who can return us to a world in which so long as you do what I say, we will be able to take over this country. That's a very different thing. And that is part and parcel of every big authoritarian, right? right. You, you get, a, get a loyal troops who believe that you're going to lead them back to what they're entitled to, to, to the imagination that they, there was something that they had before that was taken from them. And, and this is the one and only way. Although he was working that rhetoric at the very beginning. I and I alone can fix it, I, be, I believe was a from his inaug no, not his inauguration. No, no, speech, he talked about it beforehand. Yeah. But if you remember the the inaugural address, which I think was written by Steve Miller. American Carnage. American Carnage. And you know what's interesting about that? This is totally a rabbit hole. But I said something about that American Carnage, and you would not believe the hate mail. I, I get hate mail all the time, but that was it. I got hate <laughs> mail saying, "How dare you? How dare you talk about him that way?" And I'm like. He said it. I didn't say it. He said it. But people had walked away from that memory to the point that they thought I was putting those words in his mouth. I'm like, it is literally called the American Carnage speech, you know? Yeah. Um, because he talked about the America as a hellscape. Yeah, he painted a hellscape that was uh, well, one that didn't exist for one. It, it always am amazes me, and I think that's the salesmanship part of him, that he's able to simply proclaim that something is happening that is not happening and as absolute fact, and people will believe him. I, I, I don't know when they started signing on to that, the, the absolute loyalty. To you, it, it, he was assembling that at Charlottesville. Um, but the absolute loyalty mm -hmm. comes after the, the promises. The absolute loyalty comes after he has started to abuse people. Mm -hmm. And that's also classic authoritarian, because once you've signed on to somebody and said, oh, you're the best thing ever, that's fine, um, once you start hurting people, they are more likely to cleave more closely to you. I mean, some people are Which like, is I'm amazing. Here. That's an amazing but thing. But authoritarian uh, scholars will tell you that when an authoritarian hurts people, you are more likely to cleave to that person. And my comparison here is always um, Narcissa in uh, Harry Potter. The worse that Voldemort treats her family, the tighter she clings to him. Oh, yeah. Uh, because in order to break away from that, you have to recognize that you have participated in those actions by your support. That so makes it's a sense. Huge, if you're along for the ride break. when an atrocity is committed, you either claim some culpability or shut yourself off to the idea that, you have, that, that it was wrong to begin with. Yes, you have to do that to protect yourself psychologically. And importantly, you also have to believe that the people you are hurting deserve it. So it is a spiral. It's a very hard spiral to break. And, and we were in there. And at some point, 
promises not being kept stops being part of doesn't matter doesn't matter because at all you're, because you're not there actually to have solutions you're there to be to be heroic it's part of you know i'm gonna i am gonna sacrifice myself to i'm so sorry make this country great again and that is uh that was actually reagan who said that first not trump and it is uh, a hallmark of authoritarian movements because what an authoritarian says is you used to be great and the reason you're not is because of them you know, the reason things went bad is because of that. And who them is doesn't matter. And I'm going to get us back to a place where we adhere to the rules that were either set down by God or by nature. And those people are not letting it happen. So if you put me in charge and give me a really heavy hand, I can cut all those people out of decision making. And I will put us back on a track that is ordained by God or ordained by our traditions or ordained by the natural world, whatever your particular flavor of authoritarianism is. And once I do that, you are going to return to, to a, a beautiful place. And even if that means that you lose your life or you lose your livelihood or whatever, it's worth it because you are recreating this great nation. It is no accident that the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th, 2021, kept saying they were, in, re in, you know, they were initiating 1776. Well, to, to, yes, because to them, they, they are striking a blow for, for something. I, I mean, it's, it's so nonspecific. For heroism, a new nation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Why didn't it completely work for Trump? I mean, he, he, his, his movement didn't, is it because we are so pluralistic? I've already in trouble with Kevin McCarthy, so you're really going to put that one out there for me? I am going to put that one out there for you, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the reason I think it didn't work for Trump is, first of all, because he didn't, I'm being politic here, he did not understand how the system worked. So he did not understand how to dismantle it. That is a problem that he, his advisors and people around him have taken care of were he to be reelected. So that's reason one. That's chilling. Reason, t yes it is, and it should be. Re if you haven't read or, or looked at or read synopses, because it's a thousand pages long, of Project 2025, it would be worth doing, because it talks a lot about how one dismantles a democracy. Um, but by Trump or by somebody like Trump, but I think the other reason that it didn't work is an important one, because people always say to me, anyway, we all go into war. And, and, I, and I keep saying, the reason that the Confederates were able to go to war in 1860 and 1861 was because they did it really quickly. They did it before people recognized what was going on. And the, you know, people forget that. They forget that the, the South Carolina legislature is the only legislature in the country that at the time chose its own electors. So they were actually sitting when Lincoln is elected and they promptly reorganized themselves as a session conference which promptly took South Carolina out of the Union before Lincoln had even gone to Washington, let alone been inaugurated. Oh that happens, I think it's in December of 1860, so a month after Lincoln's elected and B James Buchanan is sitting there in Washington going, you can't do that, but I don't have any power to stop you. Thank you, James Buchanan. That's why he's always at the bottom of the list of pre presidents. Right. Um, <laughs> and and the, that's December of 1860, and it's Christmas. And, and, and Christmas in the South meant parties. If you were you know, a white Southerner, you were drinking, I guess not mint juleps, I don't, whatever they drank in the- It's in more the, of a summery drink. I don't know, I don't drink any of them. I've never had a mint julep now that I think about They're it. They're anyway. really good. It's just a simple syrup, crushed or bruised mint, <laughs> and bourbon. And bur well, maybe they it's, just drink and... I don't know. Does anyone know? By the way, there's a big debate. I once read a, an entire book, a small book about it, about whether you crush or bruise the mint. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking that is either freaking genius <laughs> or somebody had way too much time on their hands. A little of both. We're talking about the South. But so they're sitting there... <laughs> But they're drinking, you know, mm -hmm. they're impressing the girls, they're talking about how brave they are, all the, you know, they could take care of those shopkeepers in a minute, you know. So they, they secede, and then nothing happens, right? One of the reasons that they fire on Fort Sumter in April of that year is because planting season has begun, and the Confederate leaders know that everyone's going to lose interest in this whole stupid Confederacy idea, and they're going to look like idiots. So the fact that they moved really quickly was really important. January 6th was Trump's opportunity. Okay. And it passed. 
And now you've got more than 1,000 people who have been indicted for participating in that. You have people going to prison for a really long time. Very long time. You have yeah. people, you, and Trump is no longer in power to, to manage, the, <laughs> to manage the, the army. Prison. And, um, and, and you know, I, I, I think that the, the timing really, really mattered, the fact that it, hadn't, that it didn't happen. And I have to say, when I look back at January 6th and recognize, first of all, that one of the people that the, that the people attacking the Capitol wanted to get was Mitt Romney because he had voted in favor of one of the articles of impeachment for Trump's first impeachment. And he came, was it within 40 feet of being captured? Yeah, there's video of him running in the opposite direction. Almost, it, it, yeah, being turned around yeah. by the Capitol Police officer. And Mike Pence, the vice president, was in that building. Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, was in that building. Chuck Grassley, the, the Senate uh, President Pro Tem, was in the, That's the th next three people in line to the presidency. Wow. Well, in what? that building, yeah. which almost never happens, if, God forbid, somebody had gotten their hands on any one of those people, or more of them, and the president had said there is an insurrection and we must address that with the Insurrection Act, where would we be right now? Not here. And I have to say that uh, there are not many things I lose sleep over. And every time, and even now I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I, I just, I, I don't have words for it. it. Remember on January 3rd of that year, the 10 living defense secretaries had written an op-ed in the Washington Post. And again, remember timing. Timing always matters. It's Christmas. It's New Year's. Yeah. And these 10 Ironically, guys. Ironically, Christmas again. Yeah. It's, uh, these 10 guys who you know want to be at home with their children or whatever, get together to write an op-ed and put it in the Washington Post saying to the military, stay out of this. Do not get involved in this. They were afraid of the same thing that I'm, I'm expressing fear about here. So having and that moment passed. Do you think Trump just didn't, didn't have the ability or knowledge that that was the moment or, or the willingness to associate himself so directly with, with oh, he, he clearly could have, could have done something incredibly awful in that moment. Well, and, he did plenty that was plenty awful. And all day awful. long and hoped, hoped that by omission it would happen for him, I think. If it, there were so many places where it could have gone to, if, if counter protesters had showed up, Oh yeah. If if Mitt Romney had kept running down that uh, that corridor. Yeah. If 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 Mike Pence, who was also within grabbing distance. And they were hanging him in effigy already that day. You know, I just anyway, we should get into something else. Let's move on to chat to the third let's section. Let's go to the happy place. Yeah, let's Do go to the happy place. Don't stop in the second section. Don't stop in the second section. Although it's it's crucial reading, it really is. Well, I will say in the second section, the thing that surprised me is when you strip out the noise, the he said this, this happened, you know, there's a lot of noise in my letters. Sure. You strip out the noise, the picture is unbelievably chilling to the point that when I reread the manuscript, I try and leave them away, you know, and, and go back to them with fresh eyes. Yeah, that's fair. I thought, you know, I kind of let this whole moment get to me. I'm, I'm exaggerating. It can't possibly have been this bad. And then checking over all the notes, literally rereading all the notes and going, shit, it really was this bad. Yeah. You know, it's really shocking. As a country, we've managed to sort of salt away some of the realities of that day and some of the other ones and some of the realities of Charlottesville. There's, a, you know, we, we have a tendency to sort of say, well, it's a thing that happened, but we're okay, so clearly it couldn't have been that bad. It um, was bad. We're saying that about COVID now. Yeah. You know, that people get away with saying that it was, you know, it, it's not that bad, and it was terrible. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about things that are not terrible. Throughout sections one and two, you talk about the forces that were always pushing back on making the country great again. The ones focused on making country great to begin with. Um, and it's or really great nice earth. Yeah. And some it doesn't feel like it because there's still that those forces of Trump you know waiting in the wings, but a lot has happened in the in the intervening few years since the Trump administration. And there's a lot of reason to believe that as you put it, that democracy is awakening because it is always awakening in this country. Can you talk a little bit about things that people have overlooked that the Biden administration has managed to do, that, that polls and midterms elections have managed to prove some of the light? Sure. So I have said before, and I will reiterate, that I 
my whole career has been watching this happen, watching the rise of an, what I thought was going to be an oligarchy and now it has become an authoritarian movement in America, which if you, every once in a while I stop and I think, really? Like, can, I, can you believe I just said that in the United States of America in 2023, the rise of an authoritarian movement? You know, every once in a while, about once a day, I step back and I say, really? Really? Are we really in this moment? And I'm afraid we really are. Sure. But I used to worry, I've been worried for a long time about the rise of a, what's called a unitary executive, the idea that the president can't be checked by Congress, which, by the way, if you listen carefully, having just said that, you can hear every founding father spinning so fast in his grave, <laughs> dust is rising, right? <laughs> right. Um, so there have been many a time when I looked and really worried that nobody seemed to care. That they're like, yeah, whatever, you know, have you seen you know, the latest thing on Netflix or whatever? And I would sit there thinking, we're in such trouble. And one of the things that Trump did is he made people recognize that it is not a gift, that it is something we have to earn every single day. And people are. The number of people who are turning out to care about democracy, to talk about democracy, to run for local office, to say, listen, it's not OK when police officers execute people that they are arresting. These are all things we have to address in this society. And the, so in general, I am much more sanguine than I used to be about this country. But the, 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 the concept, it's a sunrise, actually, um, is the Comes color scheme is a sunrise as well. Yeah, no, no, it, yeah. It, that's, that's what it was oh, intended to be, it was okay. a sunrise, yeah. Um, if you want to be specific, it's the sunrise um, over, the, over the, the, in between the islands where I live, and I actually gave them a picture oh. and said, um, so, that, that I wanted it on the cover. So, um, in the, the, the thing that people feel is that, that we're do doomed, and I hear this all the time, like, what are we going to do? You know, things are so terrible. What can I do? And I'm only one person. And my answer to that is, you know, first of all, we've been here before, and we've gotten out of it. And, and I can do the second part, too. But if you think about the United States in 1853, which is the example I like to use, but if you want a different one, I can give you at least three more. Sure. Um, <laughs> You want something different than 53? I'm counting. Something, okay, yeah. so let me, I'm going to give you 53 because I think it's the one that will resonate most with people. And that's that in 1853, if you were looking at the United States, you would assume that uh, enslavement was going to become national because the large enslavers had captured the presidency, the Supreme Court, the Senate, and had made inroads on the House of Representatives. And in 1854, when they passed a law that made human enslavement uh, national at that mm -hmm. point in, in the South and in the West, and by definition, it was going to come to the North as well. You thought we're done. Yeah. You know, we are done, and that's of course the, the large Southern enslavers were the people who had the most money in the world. I mean, they were the richest people, and they um, they had were controlling the U.S. government, and they were not shy about it. They were saying, "This is the system that we're going to spread across the globe. We're going to become the most, you know, wealthiest, most important people on the on the planet, and everybody's going to do what we say." And this is going to be good for everyone. Um, that, was, that was 54. By 56, you have a new political party that has risen, risen in this country in which people who disagree with each other about everything from finances and immigration to internal improvements to the roles of people in society, they disagree about everything except they're not willing to lose their voice in their government. They're not willing to lose democracy. By 59, Abraham Lincoln has signed on to that and has articulated a new vision of government in which the government doesn't work for the rich, it works for ordinary Americans. By 1861, he has signed the Emancipation Proclamation outlawing human enslavement in this country. And then by 1863, he has given the Gettysburg Address rededicating this nation to a new birth of freedom based on the Declaration of Independence. How long was that? Less than a decade. We went from the enslavers are going to run the world to this country is going to dedicate itself to human equality. Wow. So when people say we can't do this, and, and actually if you wanted me to and you don't because we don't have that much more time, oh, yeah. um, uh, uh, it's even faster between 1828 and 1832. When, okay. you know, in 1828, if, again, if you had parachuted down in 1828, I'm sorry, 1928. I don't know what I said before. It's, it's late right. in my time. Yeah, that, this makes more sense now. 1928, <laughs> although I could do 1828 if you will, want. 1928, um, 
Herbert Hoover, Hoover administration, yeah. cleans up. Right, Hoover has, you know, he gives a, his inaugural address saying, we don't have to worry about poverty anymore. What we just need to make sure is everybody gets richer, right, in, in 28. And if you came down and said, Americans are gonna throw out this system in which a very few people are getting very rich in 1828, you would be like, whatever you are on must be really good because there's no way people will ever turn against this. Four years later, they throw out that system altogether, 1932, put in FDR, who completely reorganizes the American government to give us a new system of government that serves the American people in a way that is so popular that we are still living under it. Four years. Four years they go from a landslide to, to, for Hoover to a landslide for FDR. So all you need is a worldwide depression. <laughs> or the rise of an authoritarian. Right, I mean, okay, so, are we in that moment now? Are we in 1930 right now? Are we in 1932? Don't I mean, do that to a historian. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> are we in 1858? I mean, th there's a lot of pushback. There are also tons of warning signs. I mean, the, uh, the, the sort of negotiability of truth nowadays, where, you know, which has been a horrifying issue ever since uh, you know, Trump transmogrified a biased media into enemy of the people. Um, is Who that turning around? If we can get truth back, I feel like we can get everything back. That's what I'm working for, is just putting people's feet back under them. Uh -huh. and, and are we doing that? I think yes. I mean, one of the things that is interesting, and I have talked about this a lot, is that there's a political theory about how you get people to vote against democracy. And it's articulated by a bunch of Russian political theorists fairly recently, although I don't think it's at all unique to Russia. It's called virtual politics or political technology. Okay. And it's a system by which you create a false reality. And you get people to vote based on that false reality by using fake candidates who promise, for example, to be a member of one party and flip to the other, not mentioning any names. They are people who use um, a, a name that's the same as, uh, or very similar to one from the other party, so that, part, that vote gets split and your party gets elected. It's throwing, I'm sorry, but as Steve Bannon said, shit at the wall so that people stop trying to sort fact from fiction. That's it's disinformation so that people believe the wrong things. And crucially, this part is interesting because we don't talk about it in America. It's uh, blackmail. That's the fifth, the fifth leg of, of blackmail. blackmail. Old fashioned blackmail? Yeah. Buy people off, tell them you got stuff on them. And that's, I, I mean, I, I'm not making any accusations, but I suspect that there is some of that that we don't see, at least doesn't get press in the country. Anyway, oh, I have some it's late, very so specific speaking. suspicions about that, in fact. <laughs> not going there, no <laughs> not, accusations. Not going to go there either. But it's part of the, the you can read books on this. There, there are literally books on this, although I have them all out of the library, so you can't have them from my library. <laughs> um, so, hey, you've got to um, return some of those. Um, yeah. All right, so be, because we are running out of time, and we're going to open this up to questions uh, for a moment, I want to jump ahead out of this book to today. What are you writing about tonight? Tonight? Yes. As, are we, uh, in so, case anybody's so watching easy. this on the internet and, and this is... Um, so, um, so I haven't written, and so often what I write gets changed. But um, it seems pretty obvious to me that we have a major political party that has done the, something that's never happened before in American history. They have thrown out their own speaker. And they have no plan for replacing him. And so first of all, that's like crazy astonishing. Yeah. And, and then the front runner for that party's presidential nomination is in court where he's been found of a long-term pattern of fraud, and he's just been gagged by the, the, the judge yeah. for, a, for, for uh, putting something in the social media against an ordinary American citizen. If that is not a sign of a party that has died by suicide, I don't know what is. I, it, it does seem like, it, it, on the face of it, it's, it's just a lot of crazy news with, with, with bad things happening, but it does seem like they're a completely chaotic um, uh, organization, if you can even call it an organization right now. And, and I know that you probably so joined... So you're saying completely chaotic. Like, no, no. This has never happened before. Right. This is like, like, literally, my friends and I are all texting each other going, what the, you know, and, and what happens next? We don't know what happens next. Who, who, we don't know. We, we don't know. You know, it's just... 
Yeah, I mean, we were talking about Steve Bannon a moment ago. This is what he wanted to happen to the entire government. He didn't want it to happen to the party that he was going to use to make that happen to well, the government. Well, but remember, they can't do any business until there's a Speaker of the House. Right, so Congress so, can't do any business, and we've got a 45-day deadline until we Well, and we also have, and I don't think this is, this is I don't think that you should forget about this, we need to fund Ukraine as yes. well. And the longer that that doesn't happen, the better that looks for Vladimir Putin, and the worse it looks for, for Ukraine. So that's also in the mix as well. And Christmas I'm not, is coming. I'm not, I'm not writing about that. <laughs> and that's right, that's right when, the, 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 when the budget runs out. Yeah. However, the other things that the, that the letter currently, I expect, will end with, with are the fact that the 10 large pharmaceutical companies who said they would not negotiate with the government over Medicare prices for the 10 drugs that have been selected for that, mm -hmm. for the first um, tranche of things that will be negotiated with between Medicare and the large pharmaceutical companies, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, yes. they came to the table today or announced that they were coming to the table to get today under duress and they're still going to keep suing but they're going to be. But for the moment, they're willing to negotiate gr drug prices because they have to. And California's got itself a new senator. Yeah. yeah. So, like we said at the outset, slow news day, you can post a picture. Uh, well, I, I even have a picture, which is it's easier for me to write than it is to post a picture because I don't have, <laughs> I'm not a photographer. And, uh, and those captions, you know, it took. Captions last, are last hard. It took me four hours last Thanksgiving to write, Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm like, I wrote all this stuff about the history no, of Thanksgiving. I, as a writer, I completely I wrote, understand that. And then finally, I'm like, ah, screw it, Happy <laughs> Thanksgiving. And then I thought, and then I went to, I looked at my camera, I, I looked at my watch, and I thought, that took me four hours. Like, <laughs> like that's like 30 minutes a letter, you know? Right. <laughs> but succinctness takes work. All right, I understand that there was a bunch of questions, are there not, Ted? I feel elections are won in the middle and by the party that successfully convinces independents and a small number of converts to not vote strictly for their candidate of the party. To that regard, would you do anything different if you were to write your letters with that audience in mind? I feel the rest of us are just part of the choir. So that's a good question. It and it, 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 the, the one thing I would say right now is that I am not a political commentator, and I do not intend to continue these letters for the rest of eternity, right? Boo. So I am, no, nah, there, there will come, if I do my job right, nobody's going to need me, which is what a teacher really wants, right? Oh, yeah. You want to be able to say to people, I, I've, I've given you all I got. In this moment, I think the majority, I know, I don't have to think this, the polls will show that the vast majority of Americans believe in democracy and they believe in the kinds of policies that currently the Democrats are embracing. And so what I try and do is just put people's feet under them, say this is what's happening, like I just said with the, the, with the drug pricing. And the decisions you make about that are yours. And, and they should be different than, than other people's. But I'm insisting on a reality-based political discourse. And that's all I'm bringing to the table. Diane Feinstein got some criticism from the left about working with Republicans on certain issues. And the same is true for John McCain, for working with Democrats. There was a time, I feel, in our country when our elected officials were able to set aside their party agenda on some issues, so it wasn't about one party winning or the other losing, but about the American people. When did, all, when did it all go That's wrong? That's how it's supposed to work, right? <laughs> did it always work like that? It, it, or is that it, a, there something we were remembering fondly that wasn't no, the no, thing? No, 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 no. Since World War II, that has been, and we could do it the various periods before that if you would like, but since World War II, when members of both parties agreed with what's known as the liberal consensus, the idea that the government has a role to play regulating the economy, providing a basic social safety net, promoting infrastructure, and protecting civil rights, that was shared by members of both parties. They argued about the levels of that. They right. argued about the way that was going to be done. But the point of negotiations in Congress was that things are bipartisan. You know, the, the Voting Rights Act is bipartisan. 
you know, things are bipartisan until the 1990s. And what we know as the Hastert, uh, the Hastert rule, which isn't really a rule, really comes up under Newt Gingrich, who's Speaker of the House in the early 90s. And what he says is that he will not bring up uh, uh, on the Republican side, anything for a vote on the floor of Congress that doesn't have the votes of a majority of his conference. Of his own party. Of his own party, that's right. And what that means then is that working across the aisle for the Republicans is an anathema, which is of course why there's currently not a Speaker of the House today. The Democrats have been willing to work across the aisle, but the Republicans haven't wanted to do it because that will then give them the problem of being primaried at home. And one of the things, I mean, we do not know what's gonna come out of what just happened in Washington, but yeah, it was a big deal when McCarthy said, okay, I'm not gonna just work within my conference, I'm gonna rely on Democratic votes. And it was all but one of the Democrats who voted for the continuing resolution that pushed forward the, the budget negotiations, negotiations for 45 days. And you know, it was a really big deal. There were all kinds of news stories about it. And a lot of us are like, that's the way it's yeah. supposed to work. That's how it's supposed to happen. And that's one of the reasons we didn't have immigration reform. There have been a number, not a number, I think there have been two times that in, the, in recent memory that, uh, that a bipartisan group has managed to come together and put together an immigration package that could easily have passed the House of Representatives. Yes. And John Boehner wouldn't put it forward in one case because he knew it wouldn't get the majority of the Republicans. Well, and, and we have reached a, a point where it's not just that they can't compromise, it's more that they can't be seen to compromise. That's correct, yeah. That, that, yeah. That, that so they actually compromise a on a lot. I mean, one of the things that you don't see is the stuff that does get through on a bipartisan basis because you know, there's an awful lot of the government that simply does get done. But the stuff that, there's a fascinating political science study that suggests that so long as things are not in the news, that people are willing to compromise on them. But the minute they get into the news, all of a sudden people run to their corners because they don't want to be seen as compromising. They don't want to get the other party's cooties. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you know what a cootie is? I do not. Do you? I do. You, well, and we're going to have to table that. the next question for a moment. What's a cootie? A cootie is, a, this always kills me. Do we, have, do we have kindergarten, any kindergarten teachers here? Remember that game, cooties? Yes. A cootie is a nickname for a louse. A, a little lice, oh. a, the singular of a lice, it's a louse. A louse, sure. And they, that became an, a common word for it during World War I in the trenches because there were so many lice in the trenches. And every time I see a bunch of kindergartners playing cootie, I'm like, you're giving your children lice to play with. <laughs> but, but that's what cootie, you know, cooties and cootie shots, it was from li louse. That was a world. worthwhile left turn. Uh, let's go to the next question. <laughs> What is your take on the Electoral College? How important is it to democracy? Oh, man, come on. You know, <laughs> so, That's Joe Biden's favorite phrase. Oh, is it? Come on, man. Um, uh, I said, man, come on, though. So um, the Electoral College had its own specific design and reason to be used in the early when, it, when it, they put it together. And I could go on at length about that, and I will not do that to you. Because it becomes perverted in, in, the, in the election of 1800 by my dear friend Thomas Jefferson, who, um, that's an inside joke, I'm, I'm not a fan of Thomas Jefferson, because he recognizes that he would, in fact, have won the election of 1896 if Virginia had gone as a block, because Virginia had 10 gazillion electoral votes in that early period. I'm exaggerating slightly. But where Virginia went, so did the rest of the nation. So he gets Virginia to vote as a block. And everybody, and James Madison is like, you can't do that. We have to amend the Constitution so you don't do it. And then he dies. So the, the other states recognize that their guys won't get in unless they go and vote as a block as well. So the Electoral College is perverted from 1800 on. And it has never done what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to be representational. So here's what I would say. The Electoral College is gonna be a really hard thing to get rid of because a lot of people are like, you can't touch it. So I'm like, okay, let's keep it. But let's make it do what it was originally supposed to do, that is be representational, which would do a huge change in the way sure. we do, we do everything. All the states have to do that at once or it'd have to be a federal law because the state that maintains all its electoral votes in the same basket has by definition, more power. Which is exact, that's right. That's exactly right. So it would have to be at the federal level. But in order, I'm talking about getting around the, the popular reluctance to change what people understand as in being important as the Electoral College. I will also say, though, we have a bigger problem with the Electoral College than that. And that was that in 1820, 19, I'm sorry, 1929, the uh, House of Representatives recognized that there were 
um, or Congress recognized that there were more people living in cities than there were living in the country and they were immigrants. Not entirely, but largely. So they capped the number of seats in the House of Representatives in 1929. They actually start messing around with it in early, the early 1920s. They cap it in 1929. And what that means is that if, in fact, we had the same kind of representation we had now that we had until 1929, we would have more than 1,000 people in the House of Representatives. And if you think about what that would translate to in the Electoral College, where a state gets the same number of electors that it has senators <coughs> and members of the House of Representatives, that would be a, a huge change. And those are both things that must be fixed going it forward. It seems like these two very just fixes also coincidentally would, at, in their, our current configuration, greatly benefit Democrats. That's correct. Yes. Free and fair vote, you know, one person, one vote, we would not be where we are right now. We are currently under a form of minority rule. And it's not okay. It's just not okay. The fixes are not going to be easy, but they must be made if we're going to go into the 21st century and the 22nd beyond that. Yeah, I just want to get to Tuesday. <laughs> you are a historian. Not everything in our nation's history is glorious, and we learn from our history. Would you comment on the effort from some um, who don't want to talk about certain parts of our history. So this is, I mean, actually, one of the things that I was hoping we were going to talk about was what this book is designed to do. And, and one of the things that I, the points that I try and make in it is that the idea that we had a perfect past is what I would call an authoritarian version of history. If we can just go back to that perfect moment, you know, when we, ha when we lived so beautifully back then and we get rid of all the messiness of the present, um, in contrast to that, I think one of the things that has always made America strong has been the fact that its marginalized peoples have always demanded inclusion in the principles of the Declaration of Independence from the very beginning. And when America is expanding its understanding of democracy and of who gets to have a say in our society, we are always doing that because of the voices of marginalized Americans. So rather than saying there's American history and then there is uh, the history of marginalized peoples within that, I would flip that script and say the history of America is the history of marginalized peoples that are expanding the, the principles that the founders laid down without even understanding really what they were doing. So um, there, it's in a funny way kind of a, a mixture of both the 1776 project that says everything was great in 1776. And, and everything since then, I've read it, everything since then has just been a blip, which <laughs> itself is a really interesting <clears throat> history, um, which is actually, but I won't give it to you. Or the history that says, America can never be great because of its history of racism and, and sexism and classism. And what I'm suggesting is that in fact, what has made America be the country it is, is the fact that marginalized peoples who were excluded by those framers have grabbed those principles and tried to make them a reality, which at the end of the day is the only real strength America has ever had. Two more questions. Jimmy Carter, he just had a big birthday. Would you comment on what you think his legacy should be? That's such a great question, and I've actually been doing a really deep dive into Jimmy Carter, so how much time do you have? No, I, I'm kidding, but not entirely. Carter was given such a bad rap. The reason that I was focusing on the Voting Rights Act, and this is not in the book at all, is um, because I think Carter was really trying to grapple with what a multicultural democracy would look like. And he, he recognized both the dangers of climate change, although they, we didn't call it that in those days, the need to preserve the earth, he said, the dangers of nuclear war, because of course he'd worked on a nuclear sub and had endangered himself by trying to help others in a, in a dangerous situation on that sub. And um, so his domestic policies were really, I think, an attempt to grapple with multicultural democracy. But he also did, so I think his legacy, I think, I think his legacy is going to be a good one. But, but I'm also interested in him on, in foreign affairs because when you look at the Biden administration, and this is how I got into it, the Biden administration with Antony Blinken at Secretary of State has, I think, attempted to 
square a circle, and that is that American democracy has had a really bad legacy of imperialism and colonialism when they tried to spread democracy overseas. It's a contradiction, right? <clears throat> Even Andrew yeah. Carnegie was like, how are you gonna put an American flag up in the Philippines, right? Because you've just conquered them. And I think what they have tried to do is to square the idea of spreading democracy without a legacy of colonialism by emphasizing regionalism and the idea of Americans sitting at a regional table in the Indo-Pacific, for example, or in Latin America, or in many of the other places where they have been working. And central to that has been the concept of protecting human rights. So if you look into American history, it's, there's not a lot of foreign affairs since World War II that prioritized human rights. And we have some really bad history there. I mean, really horrific history. Jimmy Carter, actually called out Nixon and Kissinger for their actions in Chile in his early foreign affairs speeches and said we must center human rights in our foreign affairs. And I think that when the legacy, uh, when the, the Biden administration's foreign affairs policy is written, you're gonna have to look back to Carter for that. And so, yeah. I could be wrong. I mean, I haven't put any of this to, in front of peers, which is what historians do. But, but his, you, can, you can read all this yourself, by the way. Um, the, the, the State Department has a fabulous series of, of um, what they consider the highlights of each president's term. And they're, you know, they're not that long. They're a few hundred pages. And Carter is, is um, you know, they, they excerpt what they think is important. So I think his, his legacy is going to be a lot better than he was. I think he was really given short shrift by the people who came after him. Last question. Um, I think one of the reasons why your newsletter is so popular and successful is that news coverage of politics and current events have been sadly reduced to sports coverage, winning and losing, or like covering the markets, who's up and who's down, or this poll or that poll. Much of it lacks perspective. Who or what do you blame for that direction? So I don't ever like to blame journalists because it's worth remembering that their job is a very hard one and it's a very dangerous one. And the, the, there are a number of people, including journalists, who are kind of taking pot shots at each other. And I'm not kind of a pot shot person, because it's hard. What we do is very hard. And that being said, I feel like the depth of reporting back when each major news organization had people all over the world, they had people who had been in places and could, could do something other than a horse race, was, uh, gave you the potential for much deeper history and much deeper uh, a sense of what had happened. So for example, in the old days, the old days, you know, <laughs> when somebody was on stage and something happened in another country and there was an assassination or something, they'd say, oh my God, do you remember 23 years ago when, when he had that issue in the, the bill in front of the, the parliament? And you're thinking nowadays, who could do that nowadays? Christiana Monpour, probably. Mm -hmm. Who else? Who else could sit there and riff on the, the history of a foreign leader? Anyway, so I think there's that, but I That's also part think- part of it, I'm sure, yeah. But I also think the, the look for clicks, you know, the, the need to have eyeballs yeah. on everything. And you know, I have an enormous advantage because I don't care if anybody's got their eyeballs on what I'm doing because I know that I'm keeping a record that somebody is gonna read someday, which is all a historian ever wants. So, so I don't, and no one's gonna fire me. I mean, because I, I would do it if nobody were reading it, and I would do it if 16 million people were reading it, because I'm keeping a record. So I have an enormous advantage over people who can be fired because they're not getting clicks. And that's, I think, a, a problem with the way we're, with the way we're doing uh, journalism right now. Um, I don't have a closing statement to you, other than the fact that you need to get to some writing. Yeah, I do. And I, 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 what I do want to say is to thank you all because a lot of the spotlight is on me these days, and I, I really cannot emphasize enough that it is not me. It is you asking questions and reading what I write and arguing with me every single night I make mistakes. <laughs> and I, sometimes they're bad. I got the wrong congressman in the letter the other night. And, oh, and then I went to sleep. You should have seen my phone when I woke up. Uh. And, and it just is what it is. So I do the best I can. But this is really about creating a community of people from all walks of life, from all political backgrounds, who disagree on a lot of stuff, 
saying that this country matters and the people in this country matter. And I am so thankful to you and I am so proud to be part of this movement that echoes the best of our past where people said we can put aside our differences because we believe in human self-determination and we want to be part of that. So, so what I have to say is thank you all. Thank you for being here and thank you for making my life what well, it is. So thank you.